well, the night that the men that came by to visit from the church that we went to that night, when they shared with him, they left there telling him that they loved him. And he had never really had another man tell him that. So it was one of those situations where he was like, wow, there's something different here. They showed love to me and then they told me that they loved me. I mean, he poured out all his alcohol and booze that night. There were flies around our back porch for, for days. Good afternoon. I'm Pat McClurkin, and this is Friday Viewpoint on Bot Radio Network. I'm in the studio today with one of my favorite people, and that is Byron Tyler. And Byron, I'm going to be like a fly on the wall today because we have a really special interview to do today. Well, I'm not going to let you be too much of a fly on the wall, Pat, because you're very much connected with our guest today. I am. And the family of our guest that you have a heart for, a long, loving relationship with, the Bramlett family. So you're not going to go too far. I can promise you that. Well, I'm excited because we are a part of something really unique and special, and I'm going to give our guests the privilege of introducing that to our listening audience. But I do want to say this program today is about John Bramlett, and I could not miss the opportunity to tell our listeners what John has meant to our family, especially to my husband. He discipled my husband when he was a new Christian, Jesse became very much a part of his ministry, as did my dad. So I am so grateful for what is happening in the lives of the Bramlett family right now. And, of course, Nancy and I are partners in crime all the time, have been friends for a long time. And Andy and his brother Don were very instrumental in the lives of our boys growing up. I still remember the days when they used to come by our our house and pick the boys up and take them to play football. And our boys thought they were playing with celebrities. I am very happy to welcome Andy Bramlett to the program of Mid-South Viewpoint. Andy, hi. Welcome to the program. Thank you, Byron. Thank you, Miss Pat. Obviously, it's always a privilege to be here. Here with you all, especially to speak about such an important event that's going on in our life. A movie about your father. Yes. What's yes. that like for your family? Uh, very humbling. It's one of those things, Byron, that we've wanted to do for a while. I've wanted to do for a while and have been told that we should do for a while. Now that it's coming to fruition, it's very surreal for me, but it's also at the other end a very gratifying thing to be able to put my dad's story on film. A story it is for our listeners who might not be familiar with John the Bull Bramlett. Born here in Memphis back in 1941, a former American football linebacker who played from 65 to 71 on four different teams, the Denver Broncos, the Miami Dolphins, and in the American Football League, Patriots and the Atlanta Falcons in the National Football League. Is that right? Yes. Around the middle part of my dad's career, the AFL was merged with the NFL. Two different leagues? It was. It was two different leagues. When dad broke into the league in 65, it was the American Football League and the National Football League. And you had several teams in the American Football League that were trying to make it. They knew that they had made it when Joe Namath and the New York Jets won the Super Bowl, beat the NFL champions. So uh, they arrived, decided to merge after that. So Those were some great years in football. Broadway Joe and some of the standouts that actually are part of this Absolutely. documentary. There are several teammates of my dad actually ended up being opponents as well with Joe Namath and Jim Kick, Larry Zonka. There are several in there that were in the AFL at the time, and obviously they did not have the paychecks that they do today. Back then, they played because of the love of the game. So not only did Elvis Presley star out of Humes High, your father came out of Humes. He did. He came out of Humes. He was about five years behind Elvis, maybe six. Yes, he was out of Humes High School. You are the youngest of the two boys, your brother Don. I'm actually the oldest of the two boys. Are you the oldest? But the smallest. I did not realize that. I'm the oldest. I've known you guys for how long? Oh, it can't even count. 25 at least. At least, if not more. I always thought, Andy, that you were the younger brother. Don is the largest of the two. I call him my bigger brother younger brother. So being larger doesn't mean you're better then? Not necessarily. (laughs) necessarily. He got the looks and the brain. He got it all. I don't know what happened the first time around. Let's back up and let's go inside the Bramlett home growing up because things weren't always love, peace, and the joy of Christ didn't dominate your home. No, not at all. For the first 13 years of my life, they were not. It was an interesting situation, Byron, where We grew up in a home where there was no spiritual influence inside our home. My grandparents took us to church, my brother and I to church often, but inside our home, obviously we were dealing with a lot of alcohol abuse, 
physical abuse, mental abuse from my dad. Not a lot of people saw that from the outside, obviously. Inside our four walls, it was pandemonium. But no matter what happened inside the home, my dad was still my hero. Were you ever afraid of your dad? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I saw what he had done to people when he had been drinking. I didn't want that to happen to me, obviously. So I I did pretty much everything that he wanted me to do. So I I walked pretty thin line with Dad. He was known as the meanest guy in football. He was. He was the meanest man on and off the field. Byron, I thought it was interesting when you introduced Andy and you said the listeners that don't know anything about John Bramlett, and I'm thinking, I don't know if there's anybody in Memphis that does not know anything about John Bramlett. I can remember hearing stories about John all of my life. Everybody knew who John was. I mean, he was right up there with Elvis Presley if you grew up in this city. Everybody and I'm just thinking him. there might be some new folks in town or somebody listening. There's always that possibility that somebody has not heard, so we want to lay a foundation here. So it wasn't easy growing up. Was there a place in those years, Andy, that you thought maybe your mom might leave your dad? Uh, Probably never a time where I thought she would. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of times where I thought she had the right to, I'm sure, as a kid. But talking about stick-to-itiveness, remembering her vows, I mean, she took her vows and she remembered them. And actually, she lived them out because she was going to stay in that marriage no matter what. Now, was she at that time a follower of Christ? She was not. And actually, the testimony that my mom and dad both give is that she became a Christian. She came to know the Lord shortly before my dad did. At and a home Bible study, didn't she, Andy? Was she it did. A home she Bible started study? going to a Bible study. Through that Bible study, she had found out that she was a sinner. It's hard to believe my mom, she grew up a very moral person. You won't find in any, as far as the family my mother grew up in, they were very moral people very good people, went to church all the time and just always did the right things until my mom married my dad. That was considered one of the biggest missteps that she ever made. And where did they meet? How did they meet? Well, they met through a mutual friend. My dad was at Humes. My mom was at Central High School here in Memphis. Which was actually, in those days, worlds apart. Oh, that was was worlds apart. It was considered the other side of the railroad tracks, if you will, Byron. I mean, They met through a mutual friend, and my mother was not an athlete. My mother did not know much about athletics at all. She had heard about Dad. She kind of knew his reputation, but yet still, I think there was a challenge there. This guy, I think I could might change him. So I think that was always in the back of her mind that he would either change or I could have an influence on him or he would change. But, uh, yeah, Dad grew up in a very poor part of Memphis. What kind of work did his dad do? Uh, his dad worked for International Harvester. I was just talking to my dad yesterday, and I said, we were having dinner together, and I said, I'm going to have Andy Bramlett. We're going to talk about John Bull Bramlett's new <clears throat> film coming out. He said, well, I used to work at Harvester with his uncle. Was it your dad's brother? Well, actually, they both. Both uh, worked so at Harvester. My, well, yeah, so my grandfather worked there, and then my, I think my uncle uh, Odell worked out there. Yeah, that's home. what he mentioned. His real name was Bert, but they called him Odell. But He, he said Bert Bramlett when yeah. I asked him. Yeah, yeah. So you've got family heritage roots right here in the heart of the city, Memphis. This is really home for your family. It is. is. This is where we grew up. This is where we came back in the off-season. Wherever my dad was playing, we always came back to Memphis. What was it like traveling with your dad? Do you remember some of those travels when you would go to the different teams that he was playing for? Oh, absolutely, yeah. We, We went everywhere he went, and we spent two years in just about every city. You mentioned the names of the teams he played for, Denver, Miami, Boston, back when they were the Boston Patriots instead of the New England Patriots, and Atlanta. So we lived in each of those cities for two years while he was playing. What was it like having your dad play for a professional football team? That's pretty cool. It was cool. I mean, you have to kind of look at it, though, as just our way of life. Uh, We didn't know any better. So going into the locker rooms and knowing these guys, I mean, Jim Kick and Larry Zonka, all those guys babysat my brother and I. They're like it, your uncle. They uh, they were. They were like family. Wherever we went, I mean, my dad hooked up with, with some really cool guys, and we just kind of hung around. There was something unique, I think, about those years of the professional football days, very formative years. And I think there really were the good old days of football because we've gotten such a a market now of high salaries and egos associated. Not that it wasn't somewhat then because – man's involved, but I had an interview back years ago with Coach Tom Landry, former coach of the Dallas Cowboys, and he was reminiscing. I asked him about those days, and those were some of his most fond memories of football was those days back in the 60s, early 70s. Right. You know, he said it was much more family inclusive than it is today. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I could see that. I mean, it was a sport, and it was, like I said, it was one of those sports, well, football, the AFL particularly, was one of those leagues that, I mean, they didn't pay very much. What you had to do, your family was always included in everything, pretty much. But you played it because of the love of the game, and you played hurt. And that's why Dad, I mean, Dad ended up playing hurt just about every year he was in the league. He'll say today, I played hurt because I didn't want another joker taking my job. Well, we're going to continue our conversation about this new film, Taming the Bull, the John Bramlett story, with our guest, Andy Bramlett, his son. Pat McClurkin is here with us. He is your host. I'm happy to defer to you, Byron. This is an awesome, awesome time for the Christian community. It really is. We're excited about it, Pat. So we're going to take a short break right now and come back on the other side and continue our conversation with Andy. We'll be right back. Taming the Bull, the John Bramlett story, introduces a man who forfeited the world in exchange for his soul and discovered a life worth living, becoming the husband and father his family had never known, impacting people in a way he never imagined. He's telling stories about himself and about his life, firsthand stories, and that's what I think our players really, what resonated to them that, uh, yeah, it was told in a way that everybody could kind of chuckle at and laugh, but it made you think, and he said, this happened to me. This, this didn't happen to somebody that I read about or somebody I heard about. This is what happened to me. One of professional sports' all-time villains, set free by grace. There's only one way to heaven, you see. Only one way, and that's through the precious blood of Jesus. That's it. No other way. It's not by works of righteousness which you have done. It's by God's mercy and His grace that He saves you. John Bramlett Ministries and Flashlight Media Group invite you to experience the moving account of one man's journey from the depths of depravity to the heights of a life transformed by the power of God's love. Featuring Joe Namath, Tony Dungy, and more. Taming the Bull, the John Bramlett story, is a reminder that no addiction is too powerful to be broken, no marriage beyond repair, no life incapable of restoration, no situation without hope. Taming the Bull, the John Bramlett story. To learn more, visit johnbramlettfilm.com. Welcome back to Friday Viewpoint. I'm Byron Tyler in with Pat McClurkin. Pat, what a great show today with Andy Bramlett talking about Taming the Bull, the John Bramlett story, just about to be released film any day now, isn't it? It is. And Byron, one of the things I don't want to miss the opportunity to talk about is this film is a great thing, but the reason I believe it is so great, because long after John goes home to be with the Lord, his legacy will still be out there. And John is probably, in my estimation and in my husband's estimation, the greatest soul winner in our time. We have been on many trips with the Bramlets. My husband's played golf with him many times. Jesse used to say, if you want to play a long, long golf game, you go with John because he witnesses to every single person on every hole. He gives them a track. He is a great soul winner, and I've never seen anybody that had a passion for souls like John does. That's why people love him so much. Just recently, we were in Florida, and we had dinner with them, and he gave the server a track, and he forgot. He came back by, and he said, oh, well, I'd like to give you a track about my life that tells you about Jesus. He said, you just gave me one a few minutes ago. But, I mean, he has such a passion for telling people about Jesus. People like to talk about John's life when he was in the NFL and how bad he was. But what I love to talk about is the way John loves lost souls and the way he unashamedly witnesses to everybody. And I want to go back to Andy's mother, too. I wouldn't recommend witnessing to your husband the way your mother witnessed to your dad, I don't think necessarily, but it worked for her. Once she got saved, she was tenacious to share the gospel with her husband, which is a great testimony. And if you read her book, she says it's never too soon to quit. There's always hope in the Lord. She got saved at a home Bible study, and I probably think that the Bramlets have had, what do you think, Andy, a million Bible studies in your home? We used to sit on the washing machine, the dryer, and it didn't matter. The house could be tiny. God just reproduced them over and over and over. And so many, you wouldn't have enough shows if all the people that came to know the Lord through those home Bible studies came and gave you their testimony today. Well, that's a good word, Pat, too, as I'm thinking about listeners out there, maybe a wife that is in a marriage right now, Andy, that has got full of tension and stress and problems. 
and wondering their husband is not a lover of Jesus. You know, they don't know Christ like your dad knows Christ. There is hope. There is hope in the home, isn't there? Oh, no doubt. We are living proof that there's hope. It's a miracle uh, in one way, Byron, uh, just because it was such a hopeless situation with dad. And, and even after he retired from football, he was still carrying on with the drinking and, and everything. But it's kind of amazing. Once mom became a Christian, once mom accepted, and actually she finally saw herself as a sinner. I was talking about it earlier. She always compared herself to my dad instead of comparing herself to Christ. If you compare yourself to my dad, you're looking pretty good. Well, she finally saw herself as a sinner and, and came to know Christ and then wanted to make sure that her husband knew and she just used any tactic yeah. she could, and she used kind of a tactic that he thought he would respond to. Which was? Well, I mean, she, for example, I mean, it, he tells it today that he had to pretty much jump over Bibles and tracks to get into bed at night. And on top of that, he would come home from drinking and pass out in the bed and get up in the morning. And the very first time he saw this, she had gotten up in the middle of the night and wrote on the mirror, God loves you, but he's going to get you. She wrote that on the mirror in lipstick. And Dad says, man, you... Seeing it one thing, but seeing it with a hangover is a totally different experience. But it was opportunities like that. She wrote him notes, put it in his gym bag. I think she put him on his car when he was places he shouldn't have been to. She left him on the windshield. Uh, I she think. knew every place that dad went to to drink and corrals, and she would get into his car, put a, a note on the steering wheel. God definitely loves you, but he's definitely going to get you. And dad says, everywhere I went, God was going to get me. And he was running from God at 100 miles an hour. And finally, he acquiesced, said, okay, I'll go to this church service with you. And that's kind of where it started. She was relentless in getting him to go to this church service. Can you remember when he first trusted Christ, what the change was like? Was it immediate change? Was it a gradual change? Oh, it was immediate. There's no doubt about it. It was a uh, Damascus Road experience, when you yeah, say? Yeah, I, I would definitely so. So, I mean, it was, well, the night that the men that came by to visit from the church that we went to that night, when they shared with him, they left there telling him that they loved him. And he had never really had another man tell him that. So it was one of those situations where he was like, wow, there's something different here. They showed love to me, and then they told me that they loved me. I mean, he poured out all his alcohol and booze that night. There were flies around our back porch for, for days. But the thing is, is that he was convicted at that time. And even before he became a Christian, which was three days later, even before he asked Christ, so God got to work on him pretty quickly. And then, you know, when he received Christ three days later in his office, he got up a new man. I mean, he was virtually a new man. And we started doing things around the house there. He started coming home. He was at home. We didn't have to worry about where he, where he was. He wasn't drinking. And my brother and I were scratching our head going, okay, wait a minute. This is something's not right here. I mean, something is different. I mean, we had seen him turn over new leaves every once in a while. You know, he'd get in trouble, get thrown in jail. He'd turn over a new leaf for a few weeks. Or even when he was training to play football, to go back to training camp, he would be good, not drink and all that, and be home. And then he'd always go back. Man, this one didn't go back. This one's been going straight ahead for 40-something <laughs> years. So it, it has been an incredible incredible thing to witness. What about for you, Andy? What was the turning point for you personally? Although you see your dad, this transformation take place in his life, was it soon after that you started investigating what Jesus might do for you? Yeah, it, it was. Of course, we started going to church. We had never really been to church. My grandparents took us, my brother and I to church every once in a while, but we didn't know really who Jesus was. We didn't know what he did, certainly. So through going to church, we started hearing the messages about Christ. But we still were unsure. Byron, it took me two years, two years of really watching my dad to make sure what he had was real. It was. And I knew at a certain point he wasn't going to go back. And it was one of those experiences where i like, okay, what he has is real. He's changed life. And then they asked me to go to a uh, youth camp with Central Church back in the day. So I went to Fall Creek Falls, Tennessee, to a youth camp. Beautiful place. Oh, it, it, it was gorgeous. But we, it was my first experience with a church camp. You have to realize, we grew up in a home where Christ was just not talked about. Spiritually, we just were void. So this was a new experience of going to this, this youth camp. And, uh, and a man named Milton Hatcher ran Calvary Rescue Mission for years. He was at Central Church at the time, and he actually preached a message on hell any of you listening that have heard his message on hell, it will literally scare you to death. 
And I walked out of there going, you know what, God, I know if I were to fall down this flight of steps, I would go straight to hell. And I want what my dad has. So that night, July 9th, 1975, I'll never forget it. As a 13-year-old boy, I asked Christ to come to my life. You know, it was always one of those things. I, I always wanted to be like my dad. And now I was in a couple of different ways, but now I knew the Christ that he knew. It was a whole better life. No doubt. During those couple of years, as you were kind of curious about this Christ thing, can you remember some of the conversations your dad had? What were some of the ways your dad treated you and the differences there, how he talked to you and how he handled the family? Yeah, I mean, it was very much different, especially I, I can remember this, especially as a young teenager, the disciplinary side of my dad, you know, where he used to get spankings and whipping or whatever, and uh, it would just be out of rage more than anything. But now it was still as intense, but he took time to share with us why we were getting in trouble or why this was wrong. This was a sin. That was a conversation we never really had before. It was an interesting transformation in the fact that his, his whole spirit, his whole demeanor was different. His whole countenance just changed after he came to know the Lord. And he was starting to teach us how to be a true man of God versus a man of the world. Yeah. Because we had learned how it was to be a man of the world. I mean, we saw what it was to be a man of the world and to how to fight, drink, and curse, do those things. My brother and I thought that's what being a man was. I mean, that was our example, being tough on the football field, getting a reputation that way. And we were headed down that road, forging forward very fast down that road. And I was at 13, you know, around 12, 13 when he came to know Christ. And I was on that pivotal road right there. I mean, that's a pivotal age of, of going either way. You know, God's intervention pretty much brought that to a screeching halt. It was like, okay, well, this is what being a man really is. Taming the Bull, the John Bramlett story, the documentary film to be released. Tell me about the making of this movie. It's kind of interesting, the whole history behind this. Like I said before, I've been wanting to do something with my dad's story for a long time and been, have been told we should do something. So the opportunity came up. I was having lunch with a guy, John Hahn. John had worked with athletic resources management with Jimmy Sexton, helping Jimmy in the agent world. John had left and had gone to work with this media group called Flashlight Media here in Memphis. as their marketing and business person. He said, I need to get you with our producer and our director. If you're really interested in doing something, then we need to sit down and talk. So we did. We met over breakfast. I met with Grant Guffin, who is the producer of the film, and we started interchanging ideas. And we were thinking first, okay, do we want to do a full-length feature film on this, or do we want to do a documentary? I mean, there was two ways to go with it. And at the end of the day, after a lot of prayer and, and, and consideration of everything, we said, we want dad to be able to tell his story first and we want other people to be able to chime in and kind of give a history of of the way dad was because i mean honestly if you put it on as a full-length feature film most of his life before christ would be r-rated if not worse so it was one of those things that we thought we want other people to really tell because people won't believe what they're seeing on film unless they hear it from other people there's always an opportunity maybe down the road that this will be a full-length feature but right now, we thought the best ministry tool that we could have, like Pat said earlier, this will live, uh, live on when Dad's no longer able to go and, and to share, and, or to even when he passes away, this story will be on film forever and will impact, keep his ministry alive. And that's kind of where the rubber met the road for us on making this decision. Grant and his director, Trey Reynolds, we got together with Flashlight. We partnered together, and we started doing this process. We've been in the process now. It's been about a year and a half. So we're looking at a release of this film when? The release, we're having the uh, VIP screening and, and premiere on August 22nd, next Thursday. So we are really ramping up for that. Obviously, that's a big event. After that, there's some avenues that we're going to explore as far as theatrical release. We may get a limited theatrical release in some theaters here in Memphis. That would be a great thing to happen. That way everyone could get a chance to go see it. Uh, and it's definitely going to be released on DVD. Is there a website that folks can get more details, even see the movie trailer? Yes, absolutely. You can go to bramlett.org. You'll be able to see the trailer. Actually, the trailer's on YouTube. 
you just it's uh, a great trailer yeah. i've seen it i encourage our friends to go to absolutely. the site and see it pat absolutely andy this is great i love your family thank you for coming and sharing on friday viewpoint today we really pray pat that this film will touch a lot of people's lives we've been praying again i cannot say to the bramlins how much we appreciate the influence they've been in our lives and how grateful we are for this film because I'm excited to send it to my grandchildren, especially my grandsons, and see the role model that John is. And I love John and we'll be eternally grateful to him. And so we want to thank you for listening. Get the DVD, buy his book, and his mother has a book called Not Too Soon to Quit. It tells her side of the story, and and that's a great read for women who are struggling in their marriages. I encourage you to buy it. Always too soon. Yeah. It's always always too soon to quit. Yeah. Byron, thank you for helping me out today. Thank you, Pat. Taming the Bull, the John Bramlett story, introduces a man who forfeited the world in exchange for his soul and discovered a life worth living, becoming the husband and father his family had never known, impacting people in a way he never imagined. He's telling stories about himself and about his life firsthand stories, and that's what I I think our players really, what resonated to them that, uh, yeah, it was told in a way that everybody could kind of chuckle at and laugh, but it made you think, and he's saying, this happened to me. This, this didn't happen to somebody that I read about or somebody I heard about. This is what happened to me. One of professional sports all-time villains, set free by grace. There's only one way to heaven, you see. Only one way, and that's through the precious blood of Jesus. That's it. No other way. It's not by works of righteousness which you have done. It's by God's mercy and His grace that He saves you. John Bramlett Ministries and Flashlight Media Group invite you to experience the moving account of one man's journey from the depths of depravity to the heights of a life transformed by the power of God's love. Featuring Joe Namath, Tony Dungy, and more. Taming the Bull, the John Bramlett story, is a reminder that no addiction is too powerful to be broken, no marriage beyond repair, no life incapable of restoration, no situation without hope. Taming the Bull, the John Bramlett story. To learn more, visit johnbramlettfilm.com.